All right, what's up, Morley? Welcome back to the Strong Sisters YouTube channel. How are you doing today? Doing great. Happy New Year. Happy New yeah. Year. Does it does it feel like 2020 is just continuing? <laughs> yeah. What is 2021? Like is that yeah. new thing? I don't think it's found its I don't think it's found its mojo yet, but we'll 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 stay optimistic and figure that the yeah, things will work a out. Great year. Let's hope. Uh, yeah. So in this call, we figured we would kind of wrap up with all of our previous discussions, which if you guys have not yet checked out our Morley Robbins discussions, the link to those videos will be in the description below. Um, but just want to touch on some of like the bigger picture main items that we think are really important takeaway points for people. So I'll start with one. Um, I think that there's a mi big misconception about like anemia and people being low in iron and Morley Robbins points to quite a bit of evidence that it's not a low iron problem. It's an iron dysregulation problem because a lot of these blood work tests that show you have low iron is just iron in the blood. And there's not currently an easy, inexpensive way to monitor iron in the tissue. So iron in the blood is very different than iron in the tissue. And we all grew up eating iron fortified foods. There's iron in our water, in the air, et cetera. And so we have a lot of stored iron and the biggest culprit for this iron, iron dysregulation is a low copper intake due to low copper in our food because of the soil problem. Our uh, produce and meats are lower in copper than the varieties from hundreds of years ago. So I think the big picture there is kind of, we have a iron and copper imbalance because those sit on opposite ends. More, you're, Increasing your copper intake will help with the iron dysregulation, but we're all low in copper. And so that leads to iron dysregulation. There you go. A plus. Okay. Great. Very well said. Let me let me just show, show everyone something real quick. Hold on. Yeah, you're good. Can you just keep this in? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> oh, welcome back. Thank you. People love audio visuals. And this is a book, I hope you can see the title, Conference on hemoglobin, on, yes. on hemoglobin. And this was uh, published in 1958. I was six years old then. <laughs> but it's a very important um, documentation of the role that copper plays in making hemoglobin. And this book is so important that I bought the last two copies that you could find on Amazon. Oh, wow, look at you. Yeah, and um, there's a particularly important section here. Um, I'm just looking for it real quick. Because I think there are a lot of people on this um, program that are just shaking their head that, no, it's, it's always iron, it's always iron. And it turns out um, on page 100, which I'll get to, let me do it, do it this way. It's a very important study done by Dr. Cartwright from the University of Utah. Um, and it's called The Role of Copper in Erythropoiesis. And that's a big fancy word for making new red blood cells. And so this, this study is documented proof of the role that copper plays in making heme, hemoglobin, and red blood cells. Again, the reason, why did I buy this book? Because you can't find this on the internet. This has been suppressed. This knowledge, again, the beauty of a book, right? Here we have physical proof that that science existed. And Dr. Cartwright uh, was an associate of Max Weintraub. Max Weintraub was a very recognized uh, hematologist at Johns Hopkins back in the 50, 40s and 50s. And he was recruited to the University of Utah to create the medical school there in the 50s. And, and he recruited one of his premier students, George Cartwright, who wrote that chapter um, to assist him in creating a curriculum based on copper metabolism running the human body. 
And a lot of amazing research was done in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and early 80s at the University of Utah. Where is that research today? Poof. It's all over the place, but it's not in any one place. That's the problem. And so, Ashley, your, your summation of the dynamic is, is impeccable. You, you captured it in a few sentences. And what most people have never heard is that copper needs to be bioavailable so it can run the metabolism of making new blood cells. And that's not, we can't fault people for that. We can fault the training of doctors for that. And that we can't blame the doctors for that because they've not been trained in the truth because they didn't know that this book existed. They didn't know that this knowledge existed. And so it's been very selectively pushed aside so that we can focus on iron, iron, iron. And I think it's important for people to be more curious, right? And we know how we spell that. <laughs> C-U hyphen R-I-O-U-S. So, so we see the symbol for copper. And it's important that people realize that there's more to the story. That's the most important takeaway is that there's more to the story. And so as it relates to low iron in the blood, people need to say, well, I wonder what the status of my iron is in the tissue, just as you noted. And then the most important piece of the puzzle is What's keeping the iron in the tissue? Why isn't it getting back out into the blood? And there's a, there's a little pathway there. <clears throat> and the protein is called ferroportin iron doorway. It's the iron doorway, but there's a copper doorman and people didn't know that. And if the copper doorman's not there, then the door doesn't open up and the iron can't get out. And that's when everything starts to, to break down. Very, I mean, very important. Key health takeaways from this discussion is one, Make sure that you are getting bioavailable copper sources. So do not supplement with copper pills. Well, hold on. I think it's important to understand, like relate this back to real issues people could be dealing with. If people can't get iron out of their tissues and they're depleted of copper, what could this manifest as? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, it's going to manifest as low energy. It's going to manifest as inflammation it's gonna manifest as uh, potentially infections. You know, again, all the infections end in four letters, I-T-I-S, which stands for it's the iron seeker. And, and the pathogens are living on iron, but people never, <clears throat> never connected it that closely. And again, this isn't my theory. This is a common knowledge in uh, iron biology circles and when I had the conversation with Douglas Kell a couple of years ago, he, he started the conversation. He said, he said, first of all, more life, I really enjoyed your My Theory of Everything video. I went, you watched that? <laughs> We're talking about one of the preeminent hematologists on the planet, or he's actually an iron biologist. But, um, and he laughed, he said, yeah, I really enjoyed it. He said, but the other thing I wanna make, put your mind at rest, he says, you're spot on, he's, he lives in England, you're spot on as it relates to the relationship between iron and the pathogens. He said all pathogens live on iron. And so a lot of people do not know it's that direct. And so when people have gut dysbiosis or people have uh, this inflammatory condition or that inflammatory condition, they don't realize that there's very likely a pathogenic dynamic playing in the background that's taking place inside the cell. And, and what did I learn this morning? Again, audiovisual, right? Um, this is today's article. It's um, the iron loaded cell, the cytopathology of iron storage. Cytopathology is the, 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 the death or the, the disease of the cell from too much ferritin. And what I didn't know is cells could have hundreds thousands of ferritin molecules. That's a lot of iron. People, again, people, people have this image from their high school biology textbook that had one cell, that had one mitochondria, that had one nucleus, had one ferritin in it. No, there, there's hundreds of mitochondria. We know that. There's, sometimes there's thousands, sometimes there's millions. Millions, 
in the brain. Um, but, but the important thing is there could be thousands of cells, there's thousands of proteins of ferritin. Why is that important? Well, each one can hold up to 4,500 atoms of iron. That's a lot of iron, folks. If you have a thousand ferritin proteins times 4,500, that's millions of atoms of iron. And, and guess what that does? It overwhelms the electrical currency of the cell. You think, think mitochondria can communicate when there's, what, what's the significance of one ferritin protein? Just to put this in perspective. One ferritin protein can hold up to 4,500 atoms of iron, but it can be, that what that represents is up to 10,000 unpaired electrons. Well, Mother Nature does not like anything unpaired. It's always yin yang, frick and frack, right? You know, um, Laurel and Hardy, you know, everything in the cell is, is, has some kind of element of balance and, and pairing. <clears throat> if you've got 10,000 unpaired electrons in one ferritin protein, and then we find out there might be thousands, it's like the, 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 whole, the, the whole electrical dynamic of the cell is compromised. And to your point, this isn't easily diagnosed in blood testing. And it's not easily diagnosed in diagnostic testing. You know, the, the, the Tesla II MRI, uh, which is very expensive, will pick it up. And, and that's what the leading iron biologists and hematologists are using in their research to measure iron accumulating in the brain, iron accumulating in the eyes, iron accumulating in the heart, iron accumulating in the liver or the, or the kidneys or the, or the joints, very, very significant accumulation of iron in joints, which is the basis of arthritis. So the technology exists, but, but we're not quite at the point of, of Star Trek. Remember the, the physician in Star Trek had that little wand Remember? Well, that was mobile MRI. That's what he was using. They knew about magnetic resonant Im imaging back in the 50s. And whoever the, the writers were that did Star Trek said, well, let's just make it mobile and make it convenient and, and make it really microscopic. That's what we need is microscopic MRI to measure iron status. And because that's not available, not known because not looked for, well, out of sight, out of mind. So we don't think about it. Our doctors don't think about it. And so we pretend like it's not a problem. The other side of the challenge, as we've discussed, is there's a very recognized test for the bioavailability of copper. It's called the ferrooxidase assay. And it's measuring the activity level of the protein called ceruloplasmin and one of its most important jobs is to turn ferrous iron into ferric iron so that it can either be loaded into ferritin, into those proteins, or it can be loaded onto transferrin so it can be transported to where it's needed. <clears throat> you, you can't get a ferrooxidase assay outside of a research study. And so we're, we, 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 have, we have a double blind society. We don't know the magnitude of the iron problem and we don't have any way to uh, accurately measure is our copper bioavailable. So we have, a, we have a double blind society. It's like, well, I don't know that these problems exist so I'll just pretend that the stuff I read on the internet is true and I must be anemic. But, but back to uh, Sarah's question of what are some other signs and symptoms, the, the biggest is easily fatigue. That's what most people will, will go to. Um, and, and there will clearly be some sign of inflammation and it might appear anywhere in the body. Uh, another that um, causes a lot of stress, especially with women, um, not so much guys, because we expect to lose our hair, uh, but, but it's hair loss. Women go crazy when they start to lose their hair, right? I mean, it's just, it's just and, and I totally understand that. Uh, the other um, potentially obvious sign of, of iron overload is gaining weight. Again, that the body is using the, um, 
adipose tissue, that's a fancy word for fat, they're using adipose tissue to encapsulate the iron. So it does it's sort of walling it off so it doesn't cause more uh, metabolic damage than it would otherwise. So that's a lot of blah, 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 but I think it builds on your, your summary points, uh, Ashley. Yeah, I think if somebody, like you said, we live in a double blind society. So most people have never even heard that this topic brought up. So it would benefit them to go back and listen to our other episodes with you for like an overall summary. But did you want to provide the summary I interrupted you on? Well, okay. To, so first I think summarize how, how we got here. So like, if you take a look at, for example, if you go to the grocery store and look at a box of cereal, you'll see yeah. fortified iron is one of the ingredients. And so we all grew up on cereal, right? Um, bread has fortified <laughs> iron. And so just a lot of iron overload in a lot of the processed food that a lot of us, like I consumed all of that growing up. Um, and then on the flip side, we're also not taking in enough copper. And that's largely due to the soil and our current way of growing food in conventional agriculture um, where we are supplying all these synthetic fertilizers and so therefore the plants do not need to set up the biology that they need to interact with the nutrients in the soil because they're getting free nutrients from these synthetic fertilizers and so a lot of the produce that we consume isn't high in copper a lot of and and that's just that just leads to the dysregulation problem even more so do you know what I grew up on when I was in uh, grade school? What my breakfast was? Mm. <clears throat> it was orange juice, sugar frosted flakes, and pop tarts. Where's your protein? Mm. <laughs> Where's your protein? Where's my protein? Where's my yeah, maple? It, it's, yeah. it's a miracle that I'm here. Do you realize that? I mean, when I think about when I think about my beginning, I'm like, oh my gosh. So no, and the, and I think the important thing is. Uh, we can overcome these um, absolutely challenging starts, but but I think what a, what Ashley is pointing out is the importance of reading labels. Yeah, and isn't it fascinating that what they put on the uh, spotlight of the nutritional tables is calcium and iron and vitamin D. Yeah, what's missing on those nutrient tables? Copper. Copper. Magnesium. Yeah. And vitamin A. Yeah. They don't talk about these three. Yeah. And, and so again, everything in nature has pairs. So vitamin A and D are paired. Magnesium and calcium are paired. Copper and iron, it's not copper and zinc. People got to stop thinking that the, the zinc copper ratios, it's amazing, but it's actually copper and iron. And let me give you an example why, why this is so important. One of the uh, routines that Dr. Liz and I get into is at the end of the end of the evening, she'll read from one of her books in, in her library. And one of, one of the favorite books is called Hunza Land. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Hunzas, but they live in the mountain range uh, north of Pakistan at some ridiculous elevation, like 15,000 feet. It's just incredible that they can do that. And it turns out that back in the, um, actually about the time that this book was published, Art Linkletter, who was a famous uh, TV personality, he sponsored a uh, trip to go to Hunza to study their, their diet and to study their health. And one of the principals in that uh, trip was a, an optometrist, someone who was obsessed with eye health. And Dr. Liz has, has read this book a couple times before, but again, I'm always accumulating more and more information. Now I have a lot more understanding about eye physiology. And so she was talking about the, the optical testing that he was doing. And he was absolutely amazed at how big and healthy their optic nerves were and the circulation was. And I went, wait a minute, there's gotta be copper in their water. And so as she's reading, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to, uh, to Google and I'm looking up, um, copper in water in Hunza. And what pops up is this amazing blog from uh, 2004, I believe it was. It's quite goes back quite a ways. And it was on some diabetes website talking about the zinc copper ratio 
and, and for some reason, this author happened to know about Hansa. And she said, you know, the standard zinc copper ratio for water is seven parts zinc to one part copper. And that's considered healthy water. What's the ratio in Hansa land? 1.5 zinc to one part copper. That's like an explosion of copper. Yeah. And, and guess what that water does? It feeds their soil. Yeah. And it feeds their produce and it feeds their animals. And it's like, suddenly I was like, there you go. And, and there's what are called- Can I buy has no water on Google? <laughs> what's, what's Amazon, Amazon ship me has no water. <laughs> hey Siri, can I has the water? Oh, it's actually turned on, whoops. <laughs> No, it's, it's just, a, it's amazing. There, there are regions around the world called blue zones. Blue zones. Oh, what's ceruloplasm stand for? Blue copper, copper, blue in the blood. And the blue zones, se several of them are near or over copper mines. Isn't that interesting? And I think they've identified like 12 to 15 different blue zones. So we're beginning to see this connection between longevity and copper. And it makes so much sense once you understand the, the physiology. Okay. So then to return to the take home, like nutrition steps, so, so how someone can implement things to improve their copper to iron balance in their body. Um, one, don't take iron supplements and try to avoid mm -hmm. food that has added iron. Reduced iron as an ingredient label is still added iron. Um, right. Two, make sure that you're eating bioavailable copper sources. So that's like oysters, um, liver, and bee grass pollen. Grass-fed liver, grass-fed liver. Grass-fed beef liver and bee pollen. I personally have a really strong reaction to bee pollen, so I can't consume bee pollen. Um, and then three, if you want more guidance, Morley has his RCP root cause protocol. So you can check out his website. We'll put that in the description below where he has this like protocol to help people rebalance their iron and copper. There you go. That sound pretty good? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the only other source that you might mention, uh, and it gets into a little bit of uh, controversy, it's um, there's real vitamin C versus ascorbic acid. And whole food lot, vitamin C. Whole food vitamin C. And a lot of people are buying vitamin C because it says vitamin C on the label, but when you turn it around, it's saying ascorbic acid. They're not the same. And so whole food um, vitamin C is it's a very important source of copper because the enzyme in that form of vitamin C that you get you would get from food, especially from citrus or from you know peppers and uh, foods of that nature, um, that enzyme is called tyrosinase, and tyrosinase has two copper atoms at its core, which are very important metabolically, and we'll come back to that form of copper when we talk about the mold issue that uh, Sarah was raising a, a little while that's, ago. That's a great transition into it. So, so what have you noticed or what have you learned about mold, Sarah, that you want to share with the context? Yeah, the so we had been talking this whole past week about an issue I was having with my feet. And so should I just provide what was going on? Yeah, so, yeah um, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I have been having this ongoing itch on my feet. It was like a sensation that would come at night. So only when I would lay down and it was in a really weird spot of my feet. So if you're looking straight down, it's on the insides in between the heel and the toes. So that like inner curve. Mm -hmm. And so it was leading to insomnia. I couldn't sleep because I was just anxious about the itch and it had been going on for about a two months at this point. So I finally, went to a dermatologist. She just prescribed me a steroid cream. And then I ended up going to a doctor to hopefully get blood work done. And he prescribed me steroid pills to get rid of it. So at that point I texted Morley. <laughs> Cause I was like, I know this is, I know Morley would like kill me if I took this. And I know this is not the right solution and that something else is going on. So Morley, you brought up the concept that it potentially could be mold toxicity because after our phone call, I had mentioned that there's a carpet that had been giving me right. issues or so I thought. I just had this suspicion that there was a correlation between the carpet in this new house that we moved into and why my feet were itching. And so you brought up the suspicion that it could be mold toxicity. And that opened up this 
all these different ideas into my head of what's going on. And now I'm like not even staying in this house because I know that it's infested with mold. So we're taking the steps to figure that out, which we'll talk more about. But sure. you related it back to being copper deficient. And that was a huge uh, light bulb moment for me. Um, and it's at the stage for the next steps that I took. And my feet are actually doing a lot better since we talked. Oh, that's great. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. So, I don't know enough about what it could be related to copper or really about mold toxicity at all. So if you want to talk about the correlations and this applies to all rashes, I think eczema in general, you said that it has something to do with copper. So hopefully there are some takeaways for people who have been dealing with skin issues. Right. No, it's, um, it's a, an important area because a lot of people do have mold sensitivity now. And so, um, when does mold appear in nature? Well, two times a year. When is it typically showing up? When it's really humid? Spring and spring and fall. Okay. And what's happening in the spring and the fall? Nature needs to decompose biological material to get ready for the next cycle. Okay. And so um, mold's been on the planet for a long time. If, part of the reason why I've learned so much about mold and I certainly would not hold myself out as an expert, but, but <clears throat> growing up, I had ear infections and really bad sinus infections. Um, ear infections as a child and sinus infections as a young adult. I mean, it was just, I was constantly taking antibiotics. I, between, between the Pop-Tarts and the antibiotics, it's a miracle <laughs> I'm here. I, I don't know how I made it. But the thing is, the uh, Mayo Clinic did a study back in 2012. Uh, they really wanted to get behind what, what is behind a sinus infection? Because most people who get sinus infections go to the doctor, get an antibiotic, and they feel better. And you think, well, we got rid of the bacteria that's causing the, the uh, sinus infection. It turns out that 98% of sinus infections are mold. Oh. It's like, oh, wow. And then I um, came across a, um, a study probably about three or four months ago, about smell. It's like, so sometimes I just wonder, where do these articles come from? How do they find me? Because I'm not, I'm not looking for them. I'm just standing by innocently and boom, and it pops into my uh, inbox. But in any event, this was an amazing article about the um, olfactory tissue and sinus tissue. Well, guess what runs it? Copper. I'm like, oh my gosh, of course. And for some reason, the, the tyrosinase enzyme is particularly important, again, because it's a part of the vitamin C molecule. And what's a good source of vitamin C, as I understand it, is mushrooms. Oh, so Mother Nature never leaves you hanging, does she? Mm. If ever there's a problem, there's always a solution right next to it. So, so what is a mushroom? Well, it's, it's hanging out with mold, isn't it? They're like, they're inter, interdependent. So I think the, the fact that so many people now have mold sensitivity means that they are copper deficient. They lack bioavailable copper. And there seems to be some um, dynamic with the vitamin C uh, complex, particularly with the uh, the tyrosinase, there's there's properties about tyrosinase that are unique in the remediation of the mold sensitivity in the body. Um, and you were also talking about eczema or psoriasis and things. So very often when um, when the body can't clear something, it'll send it out to the skin. So what's the largest organ inside the body? It's the liver. What's the largest outside the body? Skin. So, so again, you've got this communication between liver and skin. And the, the two most likely missing ingredients that are causing the mold sensitivity, the eczema, the psoriasis, the rash, the, whatever the dynamic is, it's almost without exception, lack of bioavailable copper and retinol. The, um, there's two layers of, of tissue. One is called the endothelium and the other is epithelium. 
Well, copper runs the endothelium and vitamin A runs the epithelium. That's, that's the world according to Morley. As I've studied the research, it's very clear what, <clears throat> what is missing when there's endothelial dysfunction. Again, the first thing that happens is the endothelial cells can't make energy. Once they can't make energy, the structure and function of the endo endothelium starts to break down. And that's the basis of all plaque formation and heart attacks and things like that. But then the epithelium is the same dynamic, but, but it's driven more by the, um, the fat-based retinol that's so important for the functioning of the uh, epithelial tissue that that's all over our body. Well, I think what's interesting is that she's been living in this house as well, and she didn't really have the same um, symptoms as I was. So she didn't deal with the foot itch. And so right. it's kind of like the chicken or the egg thing where, okay, so you your whole protocol is called the root cause protocol because you believe that you found what the root cause of illness is. And right. it has to do with mineral um, regulation. And so while there is mold toxicity, and that's a real problem people experience. It's not truly the root cause. So it's not really what was going wrong with my feet. It's that I was already imbalanced, susceptible, yep. susceptible yep. sick. Um, and that could be because I have had an autoimmune condition. And so I am now um, more at risk for these type of things. So like my bucket was already full and then the mold toxicity just like filled it up too much. Took, took you over. Right. And again, don't, don't discount all the stress that you guys have been through in the last four to six months. Yeah. A lot of transition in your lives. And people <clears throat> were trained to bucket up, stiff upper lip, just, you know, muscle your way through the, the stress. Well, you've had transition stress, you've moved, you're starting a, a new farm, you've got all sorts of things that are taking place. <laughs> Sir? We're starting three businesses. And starting starting businesses. Some 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 people in this call are trying to wrap up a dissertation. I don't I don't know what's holding her back. She's I think I'm such, done. I think I'm finally done. She is such a slacker. I mean, I, really. and, so and one of these days her dissertation will be on a book like this. Not, I, no, I, there'll be one I, copy on Amazon. <laughs> and I promise I'll buy it. I can't wait to read it. But but the, the important thing is there's been a lot of stress that you've you both have experienced. Then Sarah has the added stress of what's the what's the difference in age between the two of you? Three and a half. Three and a half. And if I recall correctly, your mom was going through a lot of stress when she was carrying you. And having a baby depletes the mother of at least 10% of her minerals. Right. Right. I was already coming out of the room <laughs> just disadvantaged. <laughs> but but let's let's keep it in perspective. This all this stuff hasn't been done to you, it's being done for you. So you have a, a yeah. different consciousness, a different awareness. And I think that's part of the, the dynamic that we got into when we were having our conversation is begin is reframing what is all this about? And and what did we really conclude was this is an opportunity to say, so what else could it be? Or what what am I supposed to learn from this? Yeah. And it became a stimulus for curiosity as opposed to concern. The curiosity. <laughs> I, think, so I think that it's something to consider for people. So if you are dealing with mold toxicity, I think the number one thing is to figure out if you do actually have mold in your house and to remove yourself from that situation, because I guess we could look at it as another form of stress. Yeah, so, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Tremendous stress. And once you remove yourself from that situation, you allow space for your body to get better, but that's where it's important to return to the root cause, which is the minerals. And so since we talked, I have gotten right back onto the root cause protocol. I've been very um, adamant about continuing it and I have been doing a lot better. Eating your liver. Eating and of oysters. course, eat my liver and oysters, which is all a part of it. You do recommend those things. And so sure. just, realizing that stress does play a huge role into it but it i mean i guess you could consider it through a cause because it really could cause mineral dysregulation like oh, yeah. stress depletes magnesium we saw that on the test that we went over with you yeah but if we're thinking about the root cause it's not necessarily the mold toxicity that is the additional stress in my situation right now because can you ever really avoid can you ever fully avoid mold 
Uh, probably not, no, but you can use environments that are way more... Yeah, this house is 120 years old. Yeah. There's so weird carpet upstairs. We're going to be working on getting rid of the mold, um, but for now I had to just remove myself. Getting rid of the rug is probably going to be important. Yeah. Dehumidifiers, very important. Bulking up on the uh, copper components of the protocol, very important. And, and then dealing with the, just dealing with the stress. Yeah. Again, as soon as as soon as um, the sensation in your foot started, what did you do? You started to worry about it. The first thing you thought was, "I'm broken." It was the very first thing. It, it, my body's not responding, and you start to lose faith in your body's ability to handle these whatever the stressor was. And people just people really need to understand how important it is to modulate that stress so it doesn't take over their perception of what's going on. Because when we get into a stressful situation, we get what's called tunnel vision. Yeah. And, and as you become more and more, when, when the stress is really acute, you lose a lot of magnesium, go straight into the, um, into the toilet. And as your magnesium level starts to drop, your vision, your field of vision gets very narrow. And so all, <laughs> you, could, all you could see were your heels. That's all she talked about the last right. time. Like, no, and, and again, we're, 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 we're <laughs> no, it's, it, the object here is to, is to take advantage of this event and get people to realize, oh my gosh, I, I, I have that Sarah syndrome because I do the exact same thing when, when it's whatever, they, whatever it is and we all do it. And guess what? Even I do it. Like if I get an ache and pain, <clears throat> I start to grouse about it. And then Dr. Liz says, are you serious? Do you, do you ever listen to what you say to people? Wait, can yeah, like, yeah. I please share a story? She's going to be upset yeah, with me. What? Okay, so Sarah 100% just dials in on this. And <laughs> I think she diagnosed herself with diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> well, because, because uh, I see some people deal with nerve sensitivity on their feet. And so, of course, Dr. Google She's was like, like, oh my gosh. I, I asked like a diabetes. I okay. Anyway, well, it's also a sign of cancer. I'm sure if you if you if you'd stayed with it long enough, you would have had cancer. I'm sure. I I did. <laughs> and one day I did. Um, but I think it's important to understand that I was doing that to myself, and that was only making it worse. So that's when the worst of my insomnia was, and arguably that's when the worst of my itch was because I was so stressed out. And like you just mentioned, I was probably pooping out all the magnesium, <laughs> and yeah. I'm already magnesium depleted based on right. our test results. And so right. you, the significant turning point for me in overcoming this most recent health barrier, which I, Ashley and I have documented our entire health journeys. And so it's really hard when I have to go back and tell people like on our Instagram or something like, I'm not doing that well right now because right. then everybody has their own opinion and they jump to conclusions. And so talking to you was the best thing I could have done. And um, just changing, my mindset on it and thinking, as you mentioned, what is this trying to teach me? So recognizing that I have a symptom and I'll be, it's an itch on my foot and that's not that serious of an issue. Like it's right. not like I'm having um, something on the inside going wrong. So what is this trying to teach me right now? It's actually a blessing that mm -hmm. it's giving me a sign right now before something else goes even worse. Very well said. Yeah. yeah. And that's right. So with that in mind, I then became very curious uh -huh. and you helped me through that. And so every day I do my, what I know is working for me. So the root cause protocol is doing good for me. I remove myself situation and I try to remain calm and think about that. I am in balance. I love right. being in balance. <laughs> That's the earliest thing. You are in balance. You can always come back into balance. You're never broken. And I think that's such a powerful mindset to hold on to as you're going through any illness. Yeah, and it's and it's so easy to lose sight of that. And um, and we're we're all we're always exposed to stress. Being on this planet is stressful. Being on this planet in 2020, 2021, it's it's like, is there ever been a more stressful time for the totality of, of humanity. I, I can't imagine that there was, but maybe there have been peak, peak moments. But so people don't realize what the metabolic and mineral cost was of 2020. The tremendous loss of minerals because we didn't understand what, what the, the way the body works. 
And as soon as we're told to put on a mask or we're told we can't have a Thanksgiving dinner or we're told, you know, stay social distancing and all the other things that we've all experienced, it's very disruptive to our psyche. And so I think it's important for people to realize that that macro stress has been playing. And then you've got something like a, a carpet that might not be um, benign. Maybe there's something in that carpet or, or that there. the home the home is not benign. Well, then it just starts to <laughs> intensify the stress in addition to this macro stress that everyone's been feeling. And so I, I think the important thing is that, that you recognized Maybe I need more information here. Yeah. And you re realize that, that the medications that the doctors were going to give you, just so people know, what I think you were being told to take was prednisone. Yeah. And prednisone is a very popular first line drug that totally shuts down the adrenal glands. And where is 95% of the vitamin C in the human body stored? Yes, in your adrenals. In the adrenal gland. And so isn't that interesting that they're, they're using a medication to supposedly help you deal with the stress and they're wiping out the very mechanism that's enabling the body to make the hormones and make the other chemicals that are needed based on that real vitamin C complex, that whole food cut vitamin C complex. That, that's the part that a lot of people don't realize that that frontline medication, but the reason why I know all about this is my older sister, but I only have one sister. I don't know why I just said older sister, but she is, she's four years older. And um, she took uh, prednisone for almost 40 years for her lupus. Now, she, her, her adrenal glands are about that big, really, really tiny. And um, she's a sick puppy uh, most of the time. And, and it's, it's been decades and decades of that medication just weakening her, her system. Yeah, they're just band-aids. When you visited yeah. the dermatologist a few years ago for the blood work, she the, dermatolo or the rheumatologist prescribed prednisone. Yeah, for, she prescribed a few things. To prepare yourself for lupus. Yeah. Like yeah. as a precaution. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, and the, and the thing is, again, I've studied... I studied certain conditions because they run in the family. And um, so I'm, I'm really wired around heart disease and lung disease and lupus. And lu lupus, I mean, it, it, it's an autoimmune condition, mm -hmm. but, but all, there are, what are there? They're like 80 to 100 different okay. autoimmune conditions. It's from a buildup of iron. See, it, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the same dynamic. And I, I think what's important is for people um, to not drop into, I have an autoimmune condition. No, you're just out of balance. And there's a label that you've been given. And sometimes it's tattooed on people's forehead. But it, it, you are not that label. You are an individual who needs metabolic balance, who needs good nutrient-dense foods, which you, you all are going to be growing and others like you. But you need to get past the label to understand how the mineral imbalance is causing the symptoms that, have, that begin to represent like what the description is for that label. Yeah. I think that's an important thing for people to know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I started telling myself like, oh, this is happening because I have an autoimmune disease and I'm just getting sick again. Like it's my time, Right. my time has come. And <laughs> and, 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 and and that's a, you know, think about it, you know, you're, you're what, 20, 22, 23, 20? Oh, thanks. I'm 24. 24. Okay. So, so I've got a few years on you guys. And, <laughs> and so at that tender age to be thinking, oh, I, I have such and such. And again, I'm, I'm not saying this directed at you. I'm saying it to the, to the many people that are listening to this conversation. Don't get stuck in that label. It's very dangerous and, and it's very stressful on the psyche. And once the psyche starts to feel stressed out, guess what we're producing inside our body? Oxidative stress. Because when we go into a state of fear, and, and how do we spell fear? F-E-A-R. F-E hyphen <laughs> A-R. So we see the symbol for iron. And when we're in a state of fear, we do attract iron to our body. But what happens is, 
there's a very powerful study that was done in December of 2019 by Dr. Zaman Pira. And, it, and the title is Fear Creates Hypoxia in Cells and Cancer in Humans. And it's, a, it's, it's like, oh my gosh. And what they're profiling there is that in a state of fear, there's two hormones that get triggered, cortisol and adrenaline. You know, adrenaline's job is to make sure that oxygen gets infused into the cell so it can burn. What's cortisol's job? It's really, we, we know it's, oh, it's the stress hormone. Well, what, what's the stress? <clears throat> it's very insidious, but it's binding up unbound copper so it can't be used. Well, that's not a good thing long-term. And so when people get into chronic stress and there's chronic cortisol production, that's when we have a serious problem with their metabolism. And so that loss of copper or, or lack, lack of availability of copper, <clears throat> that's in fact what causes hypoxia. The inability to activate oxygen to make energy. That's what hypoxia really is. How do we get to cancer? Well, <clears throat> one of the studies that I came across over the holidays, which is absolutely amazing, was a very important study by Dr. Sorensen, John R.J. Sorensen. He was at the University of Arkansas. And in the 1989, he wrote this very important uh, article about copper deficiency. And one of the things he talked about was the real metabolic origin of cancer. And it's, it goes on for about seven pages. And it's one enzyme that's missing. Cancer, cancer metabolism, we shouldn't call it cancer, but cancer metabolism is raging hypoxia. And it's the lack of what's called copper zinc SOD. And that's an enzyme that breaks down superoxide and it produces hydrogen peroxide. And if you can't do that, if you, if you are missing superoxide dismutase, it has a profound effect on the metabolism of the cell. And then iron starts to accumulate in the tissue. You can't make energy. And then the energy production goes from aerobic to anaerobic. And we're back to a very low amount of energy being produced. And, and so then how does the cell make up for that? it proliferates. And so there's an explosion in cell growth because it's trying to make energy. And that's bingo bongo, that's, that's cancer. And it's all, what Dr. Sorensen was able to prove is it's, it's a lack of bioavailable copper. Well, that, well, that opens up a whole new chapter. Go ahead. Leads What's that? To the inability to make the superoxide. Copper is important to activate oxygen, to make energy. And when it can't do that, that oxygen molecule takes on an electron and becomes what's called superoxide. And then Mother Nature gave us an enzyme to break it down called superoxide dismutase. Dismutase is a goofy way of saying neutralize. And so SOD eliminates the uh, superoxide and turns it into hydrogen peroxide. And then Mother Nature gave us two copper enzymes to get rid of hydrogen peroxide. And so what more people need to understand is that the reason why we're on this planet, the reason why higher life forms were allowed to be on this planet, the reason why we're having this engaging conversation using very sophisticated technology is because of the higher intelligence of the higher life forms, all courtesy of bioavailable copper. We wouldn't be here because the presence of oxygen billions of years ago wiped out anaerobic life, which is what dominated the planet, or the planet's existence. There, there, we didn't have the life forms today that we had billions of years ago. And everything changed when oxygen appeared. But when oxygen got harnessed by copper, that's when higher life forms flourished on the planet. Mm. You have a really interesting discussion about that with um, Matt Blackburn on one of his podcasts. So if anyone's interested in that, 
there's yeah. a on the Mito Life podcast. I'd, I'd recommend checking that out. It's a really interesting, and I think it's a great starting place for this discussion of copper, iron, iron rusting, and things like that. Yeah, it, go, it goes back to the very beginning of these elements on the planet, and they've been communicating with each other. And, and what I think is fascinating is that the very first, um, well, the, the very first hormone was retinol, and that's the it's a light sensor. It's really important for our eyes. It's really important for our liver. The Chinese have taught us that the liver and the eyes are connected. So retinol is really, really important. And then a hundreds of millions of years later, along came this thing called vitamin D. Yeah. And, and vitamin D is a light filter. Light sensor and light filters are not the same. A light filter is called sunglasses, right? Blocking the sunlight. And if, you, and if you've ever looked at all these different internet articles talking about vitamin D, they always will have a picture of the sun wearing sunglasses. The answer is right there. People don't realize that by taking the vitamin D, they're blocking the light in their body. That's a topic for another discussion. But what's fascinating is that after retinol and vitamin D came along, along came this hormone called estrogen. And then along came hormones called cortisol and progesterone. So estrogen was on the planet before cortisol and, and progesterone. And what was estrogen's job? To deal with all the iron. Because the iron dominated the planet back when it emerged. And so again, people who are estrogen dominant. I'm sure you've got followers that are estrogen dominant. That means they're iron toxic. That's what it really means. And they've got to focus on the mineral and stop focusing on the hormone. That, that's yeah, the, the hormones are like a byproduct, like they're the result of exactly like of other processes in your body. So that was a big point that Just Ash Wellness, when she like was reviewing our um, Dutch test results, yep. she was saying like your your estrogen and your progesterone are like the result of other processes in your body. You've got to fix your mineral imbalances first, and yeah. then fixing those will then result in better hormone production. Exactly. Again, the body does not run on hormones. Everybody thinks they do, and certainly yeah. that's what most doctors think. <clears throat> Trust me, the minerals are are the the main event, and every hormone is made from an enzyme, 100% of them, and every enzyme must have minerals to activate it. Yeah. So, so again, the, the hormone is an expression of an imbalance that needs to be corrected. Yeah, I think that's very clear when you think about the female cycle yeah. and typical PMS symptoms and how those are actually not normal and how you can make lifestyle and nutrition changes to, I don't know, mitigate them or rather just have a normal cycle. Which is exactly. back to the fact that maybe you are, are getting the adequate minerals and nutrients that you need to have the appropriate amount of hormones at the right time in your cycle to be a normal functioning human all throughout the month. So it's exactly. just that uh, you can control these things. Again, and, and, it's, and you can control it through a, a really healthy diet and proper supplementation. Yeah. I don't think medication is essential. And there are a lot of people I'm sure listening to this who are on meds and that's fine. They, they can stay on those meds while they begin to introduce this more foundational uh, recovery program. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think even if somebody's listening to this and they're skeptical, I think just believing in something is a huge uh, stress release. Just feeling like, okay, this is going to work for me. I'm going to come back into balance. Like I can be healthy. I am healthy. Yeah. And going from there, instead of coming at it as a skeptical mindset or that you are not in control of your health or your future, it's a very powerful mindset switch that you helped me regain this past week. No, I think that's great. And that, you know, I was thinking about the, the phrase that, that I, um, I'm so quick to teach people is I love being in balance. And there's really, really three parts to that phrase. In the same way that on a farm, you got to have sunlight, you've got to have water, and you've got to have soil, right? Those are three really important parts. So 
<clears throat> that affirmation, I love being in balance, what's the soil is saying it in the present tense. I love being in balance. That's very, very important. Then what is the water is saying it with emotion. I love and, being in balance. And what's the, <laughs> what's the sunlight? Love. It's the, the gratitude. I love being in balance. Be, be, expressing, you know, I, I love being in balance. That's kind of flat, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's present tense and there's gratitude there. But when you put this kind of this lilt on, I love being in balance. I love being in balance. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it just, it, it electrifies the psyche to say, all right, well then let's get there. Because what people realize- what you say, it's how you say it. Marie. There you go, exactly. <laughs> and again, it, it's, and back to the farm, it isn't just that you have soil, water, and sunlight. It's in the right, it's in the right combination and in the right sequence and in the right um, relationship to each other. Because if a, if, a, if a farm suddenly gets inundated with too much water, no good. If it suddenly gets inundated with too much sunlight, no good. Yeah. So, if that soil is healthy soil with the proper biology, it can store more water. Exactly. In aggregates. Exactly. No, and, and who knows that better than you, right? Um, so, plenty, <laughs> plenty. I'm trying, but she's getting there. <laughs> well, of the three of us, I'm going to defer to uh, Ashley, I think. Well, so, that's fine. Yeah. And, and then I can't wait to read her book. Oh God. <laughs> no, it's, I th but I think what's important for people to realize is just that this can be very simple. Yeah. Now, what's the, what's the challenge there? People who are drawn to these types of conversations, who are embracing what we're talking about, tend to have high IQ. At least I think they do. And, and so people who are listening to this conversation have already passed the IQ test. Because they, they said, I want to spend some time with the sisters and this, and this, this guy named uh, Morley. And, but people with high IQ have two genetic defects. We're control freaks. We love to be in control. And we love complexity. Because we're really smart and we can untie intellectual knots. And when we start to yammer back and forth about how simple this is, the high IQ audience is like, I'm not sure I like that. <laughs> and so what I advise my clients to do is, if this message is too simple, do it standing on your head. It's more <laughs> difficult, but it still works. And I think what's, what's missing now is the wisdom of our ancestors. You know, what, did, what did our grandparents and great-grandparents really teach us? They were teaching us the wisdom of simplicity. And it doesn't need to be complicated. And I think, you know, again, to, to pick on, on Ashley, think about what you had to go through to write that paper. But I bet if you were pushed right now, you could probably reduce it to a couple sentences, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So what, what's the essence of your dissertation in, in two sentences? Improved process monitoring and control strategies to improve material placement in bio 3D printing. There you go. And, and, and it's again, it's a very simple concept, but in order to apply what you've just said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Got a lot of work, <laughs> lot of work involved, right? And then and then in, in Sarah's situation where she was getting lost in her heels and her feet. She needed to step back and say, wait a minute, what, what am I being taught here? What's the message? And to be able to reduce it to a simple essence of maybe my body is trying to tell me something. It yeah. isn't necessarily that I'm broken. Maybe something, maybe the environment's changed. That was that was really important to acknowledge. And maybe, maybe I still have an imbalance that I thought I had overcome. Yes. Yeah. So absolutely. All right. Um, Morley, I have a challenge for you or like maybe a possible future video discussion question. Okay. Um, cause we'll, we'll wrap up here soon or ish now. Um, but there's been some discussion and I've heard some things about how when we are overloaded with iron, we can't enter autophagy. So fasting benefits <laughs> are really low. So okay. I'm, I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on that in, in a future video, because I feel like that's just like a huge, too much to dive into. Yeah. Uh, but that's something that I've 
wanted to dive into a little bit because we were really focused on fasting like over the last couple of years. Um, but is it is it possible that in our current environment with how much overloaded iron we have, there's not as much benefits as previous? That's a, yeah. you're really, you're raising a very important point. Um, and I think that there is a, um, there's law of diminishing returns, which I'm sure you both are familiar with. Um, <clears throat> again, what, what happens is people are looking for the, the one trick solution. Yes. And, and anything that they're doing, they're, well, I'm going to go paleo, I'm going to go keto, I'm going to go um, intermittent fasting, wh whatever it is, without understanding how the body really works, how the cell really works, how the minerals really interrelate and intercommunicate. And I would, I think that would be a really fun discussion. We could really uh, have a lot of um, dialogue about that. <clears throat> but what I'll say now, just to salt the conversation, is that <clears throat> one of the um, observations that I've come upon is that any condition that begins with the letter A, appendicitis. Um, amenorrhea. Amenorrhea. Auto autoimmune, autophagy, whatever it is, it usually is signaling that the body lacks real vitamin A, retinol. And, and I think part of our discussion in talking about this autophagy issue is we'll probably also be dancing around why is vitamin A important in this era where people are being trained to think that it's a poison. And so I think it's a, it's a very important topic because the, the, the body relies on autophagy to rebuild and recycle. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a fundamental thing. And, and maybe the thing we can um, share now and we can revisit when we have this next conversation, <clears throat> you know, talking to two farmers here who love what they do. And, and you know, I'm a city boy. I, I, I lived on a farm for two years and it was like, oh my gosh, this is really hard work. I'm not sure I really like it. Oh. <laughs> but... Um, but it turns out that there's a philosophy to a farm. One word, recycle. Everything gets recycled on the farm. Soil gets recycled, sunlight gets recycled, right? Compost, Se manure. Seeds get recycled, the yes. compost, right? And so everything that is really important to enable life on a farm gets recycled. Now we live in a, in a society that has factories. So we have farms and factories. And what's the philosophy of a factory? Replace. Produce one thing really well, really efficiently. Right, but we're always replacing it. You need a new washer, you need a new clock radio, you need a new TV yeah. or what, it's, we're replacing. We're not recycling, we're replacing, right? Yeah. Now, it turns out that the human body is a farm. I like that. And we're, and we're recycling all the time. Yeah. And, and, and I'm sure many of your listeners know that over the course of, some people say it's as fast as two years. Some people say it's as long as seven years. But over the course of two to seven years, we're basically rebuilding our body. Yeah. Constantly recycling to the cellular parts and things like that. I'm always intrigued by, okay, so if I'm rebuilding my body, my brain, where did my memory go in that process? Uh -huh. <laughs> it's out in the cloud, right? Alzheimer's, A. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, right? And so, but it turns out, this is the most amazing part. So we have this little farm called a human being, but there's a factory worker that needs to be replaced every day. And that factory worker is called bioavailable copper. And we're designed as a species to recycle iron Hear that very carefully, folks. We're not supposed to be eating iron. We're supposed to be recycling it. 95% of the iron in our body is recycled every day. <clears throat> and it's recycled because of the farmer in our farming process in our body. But it's a factory worker that makes it happen. And every day we're supposed to lose the copper and we need to replace it in our diet every day. Replace the copper. And so this, what's happened is We've been, they've flipped the game and they've turned our farm into a factory 
and they've taken away the factory worker that enabled their body to recycle. And autophagy is about retinol and it is about copper. And we'll talk more about that. I love it. That's a great analogy. Yeah. It wraps up this whole conversation. Eat your oysters. Yeah, eat but your liver. Eat some oysters. <laughs> and don't forget the snails. I know that's a big, there's a big demand for snails, but they're an incredible source of copper, believe it or not. Escargot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll take I don't my know about up. you guys, but <laughs> I love being in balance. <laughs> <laughs> being in balance. No, because you're not saying with gratitude. You're right. You're right. I love being in balance, Morley. There thank you, you for all that you've done for us. We really appreciate the conversation. Well, you're very, so you're much. very welcome. And thank you for the opportunity to have these conversations. You, it's uh, such a, a delight to have um, younger people. I'm an older person, but have younger people really embrace this message and want to make sure that it gets out. Uh, to your peers, because it's it, this is not a popular message. It's not heavily um, populated on the internet, as you well know. But I think people enjoy your channel, and it's just it's an absolute delight to be a part of your uh, community. So I appreciate oh, that. Well, we really appreciate it. We consider you a really good friend, Marie. So excited for you to come to Angel Acres yeah. sometime soon. Absolutely, it's going to be it's going to be um, probably in about six to eight weeks. There we go. That's yeah. perfect. All right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Hopefully the, the mold will be gone. And... Did you just see what she did? <laughs> we love copper. It's great. That's yeah, funny. we won't have any mold for you. Yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah, we'll come in, we'll come in with our biohazard suits. Yeah. <laughs> she was gonna buy me one of those things. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's so good to talk to you. All right. Thank you, Morley. And we gotta remind our viewers until next time, make sure everyone is behaving like. An angel. An angel. An angel. I are an angel. Or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Marley.